Okay, welcome to today's uh, first uh, evening session. So uh, we're now go going to have uh, the Debian Services Agreement, uh, one year hence, by Bradley Kuhn. So welcome, Bradley. Thank you for welcoming me back. So I'm going to do about 20 minutes of like regular slide talk, and then it's just going to be Q&A about the services agreement. But I, um, I'm, how many people saw my keynote last year? OK, so only half the audience. That's good. So I should do this summary. Those of you who saw my keynote last year, you know this from my keynote last year. Uh, Conservancy is a charity in the United States. Uh, what that means is we're followed under a specific uh, tax regulation in the US called 501c3. Uh, there are various versions of those. Is the mic not working? Or is the, is the mic just the recording for it's not actually amplifying me? So he can't hear me. I'll talk louder. Is that OK? Is that messing up the mic? I can talk this loud. I have a loud voice anyway. So uh, that, that means we serve the public good. The specific public good uh, that conservancies chartered to serve is advancing software freedom. Simply put, more generally, promoting improvement and creation of free Libre open source software for people to use and improve. So our usual work is what they call in the nonprofit uh, geek space fiscal sponsorship, uh, which basically means we are a home to open source and free software projects. They join us, and they receive the benefits of being part of a nonprofit charity without having to do the work of forming their own charity and creating a board of directors and managing the administrative parts of the organization. So generally speaking, what we're typically doing for our projects is getting done those things that are annoying to do uh, and not in the area of expertise of software developers typically, but really need to be able to exist and happen for a free software project to succeed. That's the squishy way of putting what we do regularly. And that we do that usually by providing a nonprofit legal infrastructure for those projects that they can live under and receive those services. So Debian is not actually a perfect exact fit for those needs. It's not what Debian needed uh, when it came to talk to Conservancy. And I think Debian's actually now a, a really unique uh, free software project. Uh, it was less unique in the past. There were more projects like Debian years ago. But Debian is kind of the only one left that has this kind of worldwide nebulous group of people that actually want to make lots of different affiliations with different types of organizations around the world. These are just, this is probably just a short list, the one I grabbed off the website. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell them now. While Neil was talking, I was busy looking at the Debian website, <laughs> checking what all the affiliations you have. These are the ones I was able to grab quickly, but I think there are others. Debian makes uh, friends with everybody <laughs> and says, hey, can you help us with something? OK, great. You're, we're affiliated with you, and you're going to help us with it. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's been a wonderful benefit to Debian that, that you're kind of the, the universal receiver of any goodwill and services that the community out there in the free software world can provide. And I think Debian, at least the, anecdotally, the Debian developers I've talked to, you really like this arrangement. You like being able to work with everyone and want to continue working with everyone. And you also already in the US had an affiliated organization, Software in the Public Interest, SPI. In fact, it was in some sense formed initially to be uh, that service provider to Debian in the US. And Conservancy, for our part, we've always had a very friendly and cooperative relationship with SPI. Uh, SPI is, uh, people have called it Conservancy Light. It's like the, uh, the sort of pared down version of what Conservancy does uh, for just to focus on handling donations and so forth. Uh, and so we think that's great because that's what some projects need. They don't need the larger group of services that Conservancy provides, and they tend to affiliate with SPI when that's what they need. And meanwhile, uh, I guess it was almost, how long ago, Karen, was it two, two years ago when Zach contacted you? So Zach contacted uh, Karen, uh, our executive director, who's going to join me up here for the Q&A. And he said, I want somebody to take care of my copyrights. Uh, he was, at that point, uh, leaving DPL uh, and wasn't planning to run again. And he, was got, he hasn't really, but at the time, I think he was planning to reduce his involvement somewhat in Debian. And he said, well, I'm worried about what happens to all the copyrights I put into Debian over the years. I'm not going to keep track of what's going on to them. They're mostly under the GPL. I'm not going to go track and see if people are violating the GPL. But I want to make sure that there's somebody out there checking up on that and will enforce the GPL if 
those copyrights are violated. And I talked at length about this uh, conversation with Zach and all how that all worked last year. So the central program that uh, Karen uh, designed uh, for the the Debian Services Agreement was a copyright assignment process. The ability for Debian developers who say, you know what, I have all these copyrights, but I don't want to maintain them, keep track of them, enforce them on my own. I want a trusted organization that I can have do that. Uh, that's what the center of the program is. And as the agreement was being created, the thought was, well, what else does Conservancy do that Debian needs that's not being covered by the other organizations that Debian currently has affiliations with? And a couple of things we discovered was not just copyright assignment, because uh, I'm not really a big fan of copyright assignment anymore. I, I, I like to, uh, to quote a, a rather a big political gaffe that happened in the United States uh, years ago. Uh, I say that with copyright assignment, I was, I was for it before I was against it, uh, because I used to really be pro-copyright assignment. Now I'm, I'm, I sort of don't see as much value in it as I used to uh, for free software projects. I think people, these coalitions of enforcement uh, groups can do a lot more than a single entity receiving all the copyrights. So we have these copyright enforcement agreements at Conservancy with some projects where a group of copyright holders in that project all choose to sign an agreement with Conservancy. And then as a coalition, we go out and enforce the GPL or LGPL, whichever license is involved, on their behalf. So we have one of these for Linux. Uh, we have one of these for our Samba project, which is also a full-fledged member as well, but we also have a, that service plan for them. We have that for BusyBox, and now we have one for Debian as well. And generally speaking, we've discovered over the years that there are certain expertise that we as an organization have uh, in free software licensing, free software policies, trademark policies, uh, but other stuff too, organizational policy, that kind of thing. And we basically decided to offer that to Debian on a regular basis. Anytime Debian wants our expertise on something we know about, Debian can contact us, talk in a minute how that works, and we try to provide the best advice we can. I want to be clear that we're not a law firm. We don't provide legal services. Uh, I'm not a lawyer at all. I want to be clear about that. Like, uh, people keep, uh, it, it, just while I was at lunch, somebody walked up and said, oh, you're a lawyer in free software, right? I am not a lawyer. I do not want to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> There are very few lawyers I like. Uh, Karen, you're one of them. But most lawyers I don't like. So I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I just spent way too much time with them, which is why all developers now think I sound like a lawyer. I have a master's degree in computer science, man. I really do. Like, I, I, can, I can program, right? Um, I, I, mean, I haven't in years, so I'm probably not very good anymore. But I know how to do it. Um, so, so we're not, the, the conservancy is not your law firm, not legal services. We're not any. Debian developer's lawyer, we're not the DPL's lawyer, we're not Debian's lawyer, um, and that should be clear. So we can provide you know, sort of quasi-legalistic uh, advice on stuff we know about, but it's not going to be actual legal advice from a lawyer. Uh, and uh, D, uh, the, uh, Neil, when he was DPL, actually developed a number of relationships we talked about this morning with other lawyers, uh, and I think that's ongoing, so I think Debian long-term is going to have lots of different lawyers that it can talk to when it needs actual legal advice. And if ever there's a situation where one of these coalitions has to do something with a lawyer, we can get a lawyer that would be both Conservancy's and Debian's lawyer, and we could do what we needed to do if that comes to happen. So this agreement, uh, which I talked about, as I said last year in my keynote, it came to be by, first we asked SPI, um, you know, leave. It was, it was kind of like, you know, you go to the, like the, the old tradition of going to the parents of the person you want to marry to ask their permission or something. We went to SPI and said, are you okay with us providing these services to Debian because you're Debian's affiliated organization in the US. We don't want to you know, step on your toes. Um, SPI is pretty lightweight, as I mentioned, and actually SPI's board was very glad, I think, that we were willing to do this. It's not service, any, none of these services are services that SPI typically provides. Uh, doesn't really have the infrastructure nor want to build the infrastructure to provide them, so they were happy that we were willing to do it. So we made kind of an omnibus agreement uh, it's an open-ended, uh, time-wise agreement between Conservancy and Debian. Uh, the DPL has the power to cancel it. Uh, the DPL actually negotiated it. It was negotiated when Lucas was DPL uh, and uh, negotiated with Karen, our executive director, to sign the agreement. And we also have, and is allowed for in that omnibus agreement, the creation of individual agreements uh, with individual Debian developers. So individual developers, if they want to sign copyright, they feel like Zach does, they just want to 
give their copyrights to someone they trust and forget about it, they can do that, or is, is actually much more popular, as I predicted it would be. I told this to Zach many times. Uh, most people prefer the copyright enforcement agreement, which is basically a temporary agreement that can be terminated at any time, whereby a developer gives conservancy permission to act on their behalf to enforce uh, the license, be it GPL or anything else, on their behalf, on their Debian copyrights. And, uh, that, and therefore, they don't have to pay attention to the day-to-day -day very annoying activity, uh, frankly, of enforcing the GPL uh, and can just be briefed on a regular basis as to what's going on and not have to worry about it. And if they're not happy with how Conservancy is doing it, they can cancel the agreement. I have in my bag right here a stack of these agreements. So if you want to read them or you'd like to sign one or you'd like to read it for a while and decide if you want to sign it, you can do that. Um, there's a, a separate US, EU, and everywhere, every rest of world version of the copyright assignment. The copyright enforcement agreement is the same uh, around the world, uh, but you can look at it. And we actually just talked with uh, Mehdi, and we're going to put, the, he says there's an area of file storage for basically the equivalent of Debian private, but file storage. We're going to put them in there. Uh, I think, Neil, you were, we sent them to you to do that, and Mehdi said it wasn't done. So what's your problem, you know? <laughs> Jeez, we got to vote you out. Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so what have we done in the past year on the enforcement agreement? Uh, we didn't imagine when we signed it that um, we were going to spend a lot of time talking about ZFS last year, uh, but we did. Um, uh, I'm grateful to Neil because he told you that story this morning, so uh, I don't have to tell it again. Uh, I want to be clear that for Conservancy, it wasn't merely a Debian thing uh, because Almost every conservancy project that was copy lefted came to us with concerns. Uh, I had many phone calls from Sama developers about ZFS. They were concerned because, as Neil said this morning, there were implications GPL worldwide uh, uh, regarding the ZFS situation. And so we really were, and Linux, obviously, our Linux enforcement project was very concerned. So there was a lot of people inside conservancy asking us to do something. And, and Neil talked about all the kind of conversations that happened over that. Another thing we did in the past year is um, we did some help with SPI. Not, I mean, I, I don't want to oversell it. I did a couple of phone calls and some IRC chats with folks at SPI to explain to them how we're doing our accounting. Uh, I think they're working now to put their, uh, you're doing actually, yeah, so putting the, the you know, they're going to use our same system of accounting that we use, which is a command line based uh, accounting solution, uh, which is really good for a hacker run organization. Uh, not so good. Uh, it doesn't scale well. I've already told them that because when you need to hire a normal bookkeeper, they look at it and say, I have to edit this in a text file? Like, what? Uh, but uh, it's great for those who like version control and editing text files, which most of us do. So we've helped SPI with that, and that's, I think, helped uh, be, uh, allow SPI to do some more serv better, faster service to Debian, uh, at least in the long term, uh, for their accounting. And to be honest, we didn't do much more under the Debian service agreements. We signed up a lot of people. Uh, into the enforcement coalition, uh, but there actually wasn't any discussion on the enforcement coalition li list all year except about ZFS. Um, <laughs> because I have yet, since we started this program a year ago, received a GPL violation report specifically on Debian. Now, I get reports of violations on Linux on a daily basis, basically, but those are upstream. It's, I've yet to get a report that said, oh, it's actually violating on Linux, but it's the way it's violating on Linux is it's a, an infringement on all of Debian. They've taken a Debian distribution and done something nasty with it. Uh, I got one of those, I think, the last time, like 10 years ago. It was the last time I saw, it was this actually a, um, uh, it was one of these home automation companies. It was like a really high-end one. And they basically just put a Debian server in your house. And then they were doing updates over the air, but they were only sending binaries like updates over the air. Uh, to, your, to your house when they updated Debian. So that's the last time I did an enforcement action. This is before this agreement, years before this agreement existed. Uh, but it was violating everything under the sun because everything under the sun is in Debian. It's the universal offering system. Uh, so we did it on BusyBox in those days. But that's the last time I ever saw a Debian distribution per se exactly in a violation. So I expect we won't get a lot of reports of Debian violations. But if you find someone violating your Debian copyrights in one way or another, uh, write to the email address compliance at sfconservancy.org and tell us about it, and we'll do something about it. But it hasn't come up yet, so uh, we're just we're, we're poised and ready to help you when the time comes. So this is pretty much my last slide. Uh, the question is, what do we do next under the service agreement for Debian? I think you should tell us. Uh, you all, uh, I mean, I've given you a basic summary here, but many of you are familiar with Conservancy. 
you know what we're capable of, what our abilities are. So what of those abilities do you need? Um, we just had a meeting with Maddie about what we could do, uh, how we could better streamline this. Uh, we're gonna, we just decided a few minutes ago we're going to create an RT queue in the Debian official RT. Um, Mehdi just told me uh, that he's going to, as we were walking over, that he's going to let some of the teams uh, get access to it. So not access to it, but give them an address so they can file tickets in that queue for us to pay attention to. But you can also ask us here if there's things you know we're experts about that you think Debian needs that we ought to work on. Um, I should be clear that uh, the agreement allows for a certain amount of uh, uh, zero cost time, a couple hours per month, uh, and then we do have the option with the DPL's permission to bill Debian for more work. Uh, what we've done so far <laughs> is we usually say, uh, we can't work on it this month, why don't we just do this next month, is it urgent? And then we just do it in the next hours, next month's hours. Um, we're not interested in trying to get a lot of money from Debian over this. Actually, we'd like to find a way to give you just what we need under the zero cost hours. But we put that provision in there in case something big comes up that we have to work on really hard uh, and bill for. Um, and as I said, we didn't bill for any of the ZFS stuff because that wasn't just for Debian, it was for everybody. So it wasn't, it wasn't really appropriate to ask Debian to bear the cost of something that also the Linux uh, co compliance project wanted and the Samba developers wanted and et cetera. Uh, but if there's something Debian specific that needs urgent and extensive work, that's something we could talk about uh, doing and, uh, and see what we need. Now, if you're gonna raise it here, this is being recorded, streamed and everything, uh, I think it was very useful and it often is very useful to discuss things privately at first. I like very much that Debian is, is one of the most open free software communities, that things are discussed almost always in public. Uh, I am still in the middle of my VD process myself, so I'm not on Debian private, but I've known about Debian private for two decades and I've never heard that there's anything that important on there. Um, I guess maybe that's controversial to say, but <laughs> most Debian developers tell me, yeah, you're not, trust me, you're not missing anything. In fact, I, I, one of the things I researched when applying to be a non-uploading DD was to make sure I'm not required to be on Debian private. Because I don't think I want to be. <laughs> um, and it turns out you're not, as I found out, you're not required to be on Debian private. Um, so, uh, so, but th there is a value in that. There's value in discussing things privately at first and making them public in, in due course. Um, I think it's best to make public things public in due course, but I, I, so if you want to stand up and say, I have this problem, you know, think about whether you want to broadcast it to the world today, or maybe we should talk about it for a while and in a few months broadcast it to the world. And with that, I'm going to ask Karen to come up and join me. There's apparently a mic up here for you. Did you get it? I'm you got it. Live. She's, she's live. Exactly. And we can't stand, we can't stand too close together. Oh, we get way over yes, here. Well, I'm, oh, that was, a, that was, that was unrelated. It, it was me. Sorry. Okay. All right, I can get closer to you. <laughs> okay, we're, we're safe. No feedback? Okay, no. I'm, I'm standing over here. <laughs> I don't trust you anymore. You keep saying it's not beginning. It's, it's over. <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm, I'm standing over here. That's it. That's three tries. You're out. I'm over here. She's over there. So it's me. That makes perfect sense. Okay. That's way better. I'm not an audio engineer. I'm sorry. But who has questions? <laughs> I don't. I don't have to be standing right next to her. That's not required. <laughs> You're just a troublemaker, you. <laughs> Indeed, you did. Technical purposes. Okay. Now you're too close to the speaker with that. If you have technical questions or answers to give, please use a microphone to do so. <laughs> so so what, do you, what do you want to know about the service agreement? What do you want Conservancy to be doing for Debian? What should we not be doing for Debian? Hi. Hello? Hello. Yes. You're, yeah, you sound live to me. Well, all right. Um, in the agreement, which I... Well, to be clear, you're asking, there's lots of agreements here. You're, you're asking about the copyright enforcement agreement, I believe. The copyright enforcement agreement. Yes. Um, it has this concept that which it mentions twice, which is copyright registration. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, I'm not very familiar with that, or maybe in different terms, maybe you could just elaborate on what, what that actually does and entails and 
and, and even for someone who's not doing this, um, am I as a independent copyleft developer or non-copyleft developer, should I be registering my copyright somewhere? I think I probably know more about registration because I've been doing it lately. I, we know different sides of it, but okay. you can. Okay. So I will give you the non-lawyer answer, and then she can, you can give a lawyer answer if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, so copyright registration uh, exists in, uh, in various jurisdictions. I don't know which ones it exists in. It certainly exists in the United States. And what it is, it's a, it's a process whereby you can file with some central authority works that are under your copyright. Um, now, ostensibly, this was invented for posterity, uh, but in fact, it, it, over the decades and uh, centuries, it evolved into a system whereby the law treated copyrights that were registered with a certain amount of additional power than works that were not registered. So, for example, in the United States, the statutory damages you can get in copyright enforcement in cases are substantially higher uh, when your copyrights are registered than when they're not registered. So it's important to register your copyrights because typically GPL enforcement focuses on the statutory damages instead of actual damages. So uh, to explain that, because uh, I'm a non-lawyer, maybe I can say this easier. But actually, to too. back up just a oh, tiny piece of that, which is to say that when you, uh, that you don't need to register copyrights to have a copyright. So copyright is, uh, uh, I, this is, I'm going to be very U.S. focused, but again, I, I am a lawyer, but I am a U.S. lawyer admitted only to practice in the state of New York, and I am not your lawyer, and this is not legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so, uh, so copyright forms the moment you fix, uh, you, you fix a creative expression in a tangible medium. So it used to be that you needed to undertake certain formalities to have your copyrights um, uh, duly uh, formed, but now um, you simply uh, write your code and then you have the copyright. And so registration is not something you need to do. It really relates to what you can ask for. Yeah, and go ahead. In a lot. Do you have follow-up, James? Yeah, just to elaborate. So how much does this cost? Can you do this online? Do you have to go in person? And lastly, can you do this retroactively for things from many years ago, particularly or copyrights you held before you started with a new employer or something like that? The answer and order are um, usually $25, yes and yes. Um, so uh, so, so uh, in the US, this is purely a US answer. Uh, and actually, anybody in the world can register with the US Copyright Office. So you don't have to be a US citizen or based in the US or anything like that to register the US Copyright Office. Um, you go to their website, and uh, it's, I believe, 25 I think it went up to 35 at some point uh, recently. Um, dollars to register the copyright. Uh, it, you can do it for any work. Um, I recommend, it, it, so, so the, the confusion about what is a work in software is one that uh, will be heavily litigated about over the next 10 years. Um, but generally speaking, what I recommend to register is your contributions to a specific released version. Um, it's been suggested to me by, uh, by somewhat, um, somewhat cagey and, and, uh, and uh, game playing lawyers that you should register every single patch you make uh, because then you can say each one's a separate work, and then you can get different damages for each one. I think it's crazy. It's, it's also crazy. really unclear it's how idea. any of this is going to be interpreted. The, yeah, exactly. The, in particular, the copyright holding piece of it and how it fits together and what, right. what yeah. And, but but, but um, people in the normal world, like not the software world, tend to think about things being published. Like you publish a book, and that was the first edition of the book, and the second edition of the book are different. Uh, so to map that most easily, I think the best thing to register is your changes to a version that's released when you know, the official release comes out, like when, it's, when you know, it comes out of beta and it goes out there. Um, find all your copyrighted contributions to that and, uh, and register that. So register my, my contributions in Linux version, whatever, right? But and go ahead, Karen. I was just going to say, this is something that we do uh, with our coalition members. Right. And, um, so, and right, so the reason James is asking is because the agreement gives Conservancy the authority to register the copyrights on their behalf. And I actually have, they're, on, they're, on, uh, they're online. Um, they're actually, they're currently in GitHub because the Conservancy Calathea uh, 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 ser server is not altogether. So they're only on GitHub at the moment, but they will be on our Calathea server eventually. But I wrote a number of scripts to help you make, uh, they're Perl, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, to make a deposit. So what's a de what is a deposit? A deposit is the piece of the copyrighted work you're giving to the office for them to hold on to as the, this is your copyrighted work. Um, the deposit rules for software in the US are bizarre. 
They say the first 25 pages and the last 25 pages of the program. <laughs> so you can interpret that any way you want, because you can sort the printout any way you want. Um, so what I actually did, so, so the interesting thing is the online registration process has not kept pace with the, the PDF guidance. And I worked with our lawyers, Conservancy's lawyers on this, and we came to the conclusion that it actually made sense to register the most representative changes uh, to the thing. And weirdly, the, the Copyright Office itself has interpreted first 25 to last 25 to actually be, and this will sound great to everybody, a byte count. So there's a max byte count they will accept because they, want, they won't accept the whole work. This actually makes sense because if they, they don't have the resources to accept the giant amounts of code people would throw at them for all registering all the copyrights. So what they do is they take a representative sample in a maximum number of bytes for that work. Well, normally your patches will fit into that byte count, the things you contributed to that work. So what I do is I just sort by the person and their contributions and their patches, and I submit their, the, the most representative parts of the work that have their copyright in it. Um, now, you do should submit full files, not patches, right? So, so what my scripts do is they find all your patches in a git commit log, and then they find the files that are most you did the most changes to during that version, and then put it in there. So uh, that's, that's what you should do if you want to do it yourself. But all that work is the kind of thing Conservancy does under this agreement. So, we, so I do that work for our projects. I haven't actually gotten to registering the Debian copyrights now. We're focused on registering Linux copyrights at the moment uh, because it's much more likely we're going to be in lawsuits over Linux uh, soon as opposed to Debian. Um, so, uh, but we will eventually try to do all of them uh, and, uh, and so forth. And if you have a reason why you'd really like to prioritize, if you're a, a signatory of one of these agreements and you say, well, actually, there's an important reason I'd like my copyrights registered sooner. You can just email us, and we can prioritize that. One thing we didn't mention, or you didn't mention in the talk, was that we published uh, principles. Yep. That uh, so a list of, of principles for enforcing uh, for a community-oriented copyleft project, and they're basically principles for um, for enforcement that essentially treat today's violator as tomorrow's contributor and sort of like establishing a path for communication that allows a violating company to understand what free software is about and understand how to go about contributing to the community so that we don't scare uh, companies off. And in order to, to do that, we've, we have a list of principles that we've uh, bound ourselves to. So our enforcement agreements, any services that we provide um, under these agreements would be subject to the principles. Um, and so, I would be interested in how many hours of work you spent spend on the ZFS uh, uh, license mm -hmm. clearance. Reason I kept track of my hours, too. I did, too. I could yeah. actually give you an exact count <laughs> if you yeah. really wanted. It was a lot. Continue your question. I'll give you, I'll give you an exact count. Short, speaking, and I think as, we, as we all saw earlier this morning uh, in Neil's talk, Debian has quite a lot amount of money. And I would like to encourage uh, the current DPL to send at least parts of that money for your work on ZFS to being recognized from the Debian project. That, that's that's very nice of you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I, I, but I think I mean I think I would rather see that as a, as a, just a donation of goodwill. Um, we were we were very clear with Neil throughout that. Um, we had so many other interests in our community, uh, in, our, you know, in our member projects, which, which have much stronger affiliations to Conservancy than Debian, because this is just sort of like an arm's length services agreement we have with Debian. With our other projects, they're actually part of us. So, so Samba is a part of Conservancy. Like the legal entity of Samba is Conservancy. And they are just like, it's like a division of a company. And so, and, and Linux enforcement agreement, we also have an enforcement agreement with, with li many Linux copyright holders. And those parties had a lot of interest in how the ZFS thing came out. Um, so we were clear with Neil that we were basically negotiating with Neil at, effectively as, a, as like a third part, like a third party. We were we were not trying to say we're doing this for Debian the whole time. I, mean, I don't think I once said I'm doing this for Debian. Um, I was very clear, and because I did a lot of negotiations with Neil on ZFS, and so and so I, I would love to see Debian make a make a big contribution to Conservancy. That would be much appreciated and wonderful. But um, but I don't think it should be specifically for ZFS. It should be you know, for, for just goodwill, and if you would love to do it, uh, think, we would love to have I it. I think I would be a bad executive director if I didn't say, please encourage people to come become supporters of Conservancy. Like, yeah. the great thing about the way we pivoted our, our business model is that the more people that sign up, um, the more incentivized we are to continue. I mean, we're going to, we, 
we, we're committed to doing the right thing and we have a mission statement that locks us into it, but when the funding is a part of it, it means that we're so directly incentivized to focus on the things that are good to the public and, um, and talk about it as much as possible. And so it's, it, that's a really uh, good thing for us. And so if you're happy with the things that we do, if you could spread the word, it would be huge for us because we really struggle just to stay in it. I spent uh, 82 hours on ZFS last year. Did you? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's just me. That's just you. Yeah. I, have to go I, I, I have a little script that I can run that just, I just grabbed for ZFS, yeah. 82 hours of my year last year was ZFS, solely ZFS. And mine was not that high, but it was pretty high. At least, at least 40 hours for me. So, yeah, so that's, that's, yeah. Two, that's not two weeks for me because I work a lot more than 40 hours a week, but, uh, but it was a lot of time. Um, so. Oh, and to add what Karen said, um, actually, we, we really want to be an individually supported organization. Uh, that gives us a, a mandate of a constituency. So um, it, I, I would ask you all to become individual supporters. Having lots of individual supporters for charity helps us in a lot of different ways. Uh, the IRS likes it, for one. Uh, but also, when we negotiate with big companies and third parties, we can say, look, we have, at this point, we have uh, uh, 1,031 people who have said, we believe so much in conservancy, I'll put $10 a month towards it. And when that number gets higher and higher, that's a huge value for us. And, uh, and this is why, if you've heard of the uh, American Association of Retired Persons uh, in the United States, it's, it has so much power because basically everybody over, almost like, like something like a huge percentage of people over 50 join it, and they go to other agencies and say, all the retired people are going to be angry at you if you don't do something. Well, we can do the same thing for free software if lots of free software developers are giving us money. Everywhere. Yeah, but we were also getting a lot of pressure when we were, uh, the companies that were trying to pressure us to not do enforcement would, uh, at some point, would often take the angle, people don't care about that. You know, you and Brad, Bradley and Karen, you think this is so important, but you're misguided, you're living in the past, you don't understand what people want. This isn't that important. And now those people will never, you know, with the over a thousand people already, I see that that argument isn't coming up again. So the more numbers we get, then the more powerful that argument is. Go well, as yeah. It kind, of, kind of relates to that point. That I, I guess I don't know who are the people from Debian who have so far signed agreements, but I guess most Debian contributor or most Debian developers say to make it a narrower point. Um, are maintaining a few packages where they have more or less trivial, as in not, in, not, in, not trivial in all cases, but frequently fairly trivial packaging, and then um, maybe patches scattered across many, many packages in Debian where mm -hmm. they found a bug. Do you, should we be encouraging all those kinds of people to, to, make, to sign the agreements? I mean, how, how plausible is it to enforce on that kind of scale? And, and if someone does sign the agreement, um, do you try and track down every place they might have had a copyright? Or I mean, how does that, how does that side work when it's on this kind of very small scale changes? Why don't you take the first question, I'll take the second one. Which was the first one? The first question, question is, should, should everybody <laughs> sign it even if their they're packaging kind oh, of Oh, definitely. I mean, I think so. The, it's very difficult to determine what the level of copyrightability is, um, like what, what threshold of creative expression is required to, uh, to have, and so, uh, but regardless of whether or not, um, you know, we, even if the contribution is small in aggregate with a lot of people signing in and a lot of people participating together in the Debian project, it becomes a much stronger argument towards enforcement. And, um, and even simply, what we're, what we're, we are planning for the case, the unfortunate scenario where we have to be in a lawsuit, but what we really want is to be in this productive negotiation with companies that are out of compliance and to say, you know, if we could say X number of Debian developers have signed agreements, that means that we often don't have to get to the, the stronger argument is the less likely it is that a, um, uh, an in-house legal team will, uh, will be willing to risk going to court. So, um, so yeah, to, and to add on to what Karen said, um, there's, a, uh, th there's, there's strength in numbers, right? So, so what, what often happens uh, when we're criticized, for example, by big companies that don't want to stop us from enforcing the GPL, they say, oh, you just have a couple of crazy, uh, crazy developers that no one likes. Uh, they're the only ones who will work with you, because you're crazy too, by the way. Um, 
But when we have this big number of people, like in the Linux Enforcement Coalition has grown every year. We've gotten more and more developers every year signed up for it who are Linux copyright holders. Same thing should happen with Debian so that we can say we have, you know, uh, we don't have this yet, not, not 100, but we have 100 Debian developers who have signed this agreement. They're all behind this uh, directly. They've signed an agreement to be behind it. And I would, you know, that, the more that is, the more that gives us leverage to say you have to take us seriously when we're trying to enforce. Also, each little bit of changes add up, right? So if you get 100 people who have made very small changes to a couple of packages, well, now you have a very large set of changes to a couple hundred packages, uh, which, is a, which is a much bigger copyright holding. Because uh, when you do, if you do get to litigation, which we never want to, but, but if it does happen, the biggest question in litigation is can they write you out of it, right? So if you go into a courtroom and say, well, I have 50 lines of copyrighted code in this project and you infringed, um, they can say one of the solutions, there's always an answer to not infringe anymore. That's always the way to end the copyright litigation, more or less. You, there's past damage and stuff. But generally speaking, stopping infringement is the most important thing. Well, they can take those 50 lines, clean room them, and write them again. Um, so, but if it's thousands of lines, they, they, there's no viable way for them to clean room that kind of thing. Um, so, or at least not in a, in a reasonable <coughs> amount of time. So, uh, so that's really important. Uh, and, and so getting lots of people for that. Right. I should also mention that while we want you to shout from the rooftops if you care about the enforcement of copyleft, if you don't want anyone to know that you want copyleft enforced, you can still sign the agreements and we'll, um, we'll do our best to keep them yeah. confidential. Yeah, we're, we bought, we've already walked through with the lawyers like the, the First Amendment and the U.S. arguments about, about whether people can sign an agreement like this and not have to be disclosed. Now, if, you wanna, if we go into litigation, you have to be disclosed. The litigants have to be disclosed, but the... Uh, uh, but we, usually, as you see with the Christoph Hellwig case and with VMware, right? I mean, we have a large coalition of Linux copyright holders that we're enforcing for. But in the particular VMware case, the the actual case is Christoph Hellwig versus VMware. Other people's copyrights are involved, but they are not um, they are not privy to the case because the case is just about Hellwig's copyrights. Now, to your second question, you asked, like, are we going and finding them? As I said, I haven't went and looked at doing the copyright registrations for Debian. And if there's something in Debian that people think should be prioritized to be registered, that's great. When we do the registration process is when we'll go and try to find everybody's contributions. Finding every last one isn't necessary. Finding the big ones is what's important. So probably what we'll do is, uh, we're already doing this with the Linux folks, uh, to do, do a, you know, an email conversation with the person to identify where their changes are. It's obviously easier in Linux because it's, they're all in the Git repository for Linux. But in that case, we'll do it. We'll figure out a process. Luke, you had a question over there? No, OK. Um, hi. He's done. Luke, 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 Luke okay. will not speak. He refuses. All right. Um, I'm curious, like, uh, Debian's in the interesting situation of being downstream from many upstreams. And if you make upstreams that are then released with Debian, is that part of the Debian services agreement or whatever? Like, like, and, you know, a trivial patch here, a trivial patch there. Like, like what exactly counts, I guess, is what it really comes down to. We, our, our, our general rule for this has been um, upstreams that, uh, that kind of um, uh, originate with Debian, like apt would be a good example. Upstreams that are really Debian upstreams, uh, we think that's fine. Um, we j we've had people ask, like, will you enforce on behalf of my copyrights in the upstream project? I think, I think we're going to have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. The agreement may or may not cover that. It depends on the details of whether the patches were carried in the Debian package or sent back upstream. Um, but obviously, if there's a violation, we can sign a new agreement at the time of violation, too. So I think focusing just on the things that are truly Debian, i.e., the packaging, the patches that are carried by Debian, and to true Debian upstream, like apt for, as the best example, um, that's, that's best for this now. I think that... Any project that wants to do enforcement uh, when they see a violation upstream, you should talk with us if you're, you're seeing upstream violations. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's no specific reason other than the copyright registration one to worry about it until the enforcement happens. Uh, and as I was just having this exchange with James, you can do registration yourself too. Um, and I'm happy as just a personal matter, not on behalf of Conservancy, to help you do registration if you want to register your own copyrights on your own project. So I think that's probably the best way to go for now. But if you have tweaks to it, Feel free and talk to us and say, maybe you should do it this way. I, I don't think we're set on any of these as permanent uh, policies. We have like, uh, like two minutes left at this point. Something like that. Uh, given that nobody else is breaking patches, I suppose I, I wanted to 
Well, oh. <laughs> no, well, he wanted to ask again. But if you have a point. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. he, he has the microphone, so. Yeah, I have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a power that I'm not that willing to yield. <laughs> uh, no, uh, as, uh, as a, a, a citizen from a, let's call it, peripheral country, or peripheric, uh, I, I know that, of course, you're based in the U.S., and, of course, it makes a lot of sense to start doing this in the U.S. as, the, as it's the center of mass for, for many things. Uh, but, uh, uh, say, in order to start uh, or to help uh, similar organizations being formed in places with different set of laws, say, I, I would be thinking of on, uh, based on the Roman law, as mm -hmm. most of Latin America is. Uh, how much, uh, I, I know that would go out of your charter, but how much would you be willing to like, invest help in, in aiding other organizations form to do something similar to what you're doing? Especially for you, I think. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, we already work with, uh, with others outside of the United States. The, um, uh, for example, the uh, VMware suit, which Conservancy is funding, is outside of the United States. And we are uh, very focused on the implications of our global community, such that we have uh, we have agreements for people outside of the United States. And I think we just sort of take the situations as a case-by-case -case basis. And um, you know, some of the major jurisdictions where um, people are located, we have already have some partnerships with and um, work with people. Uh, but I think that if something else becomes relevant, we would definitely be um, open to finding the right resources. I mean, you know, the nice thing about doing it as we are as a, as a charitable nonprofit is we just we're, we're mandated to just make sure that the right thing gets done. And that means that we work with the right partners whenever we need to, and we recognize that we can't do everything. So are you particularly interested in GPL enforcement in those jurisdictions, or in just general fiscal sponsorship type services in those jurisdictions? Uh, I would be thinking more on how to expand the legal advice regarding, well, GPL and uh, general copyleft uh, enforcement outside the jurisdiction of the US. But I know, I mean, that's... I yeah, and I, I, th I think that, there, uh, so, so with that, I'll, I'll mention a resource. So, so we're in collaboration with the Free Software Foundation, with John over there. Um, we're doing uh, a project called copyleft.org, which is a general education about copyleft and its enforcement and how it works. Um, and that's a project that I'm ostensibly the editor-in-chief of, but I haven't had a lot of time to work on it. Um, I spent 80 hours. I could have worked on that. If, the only ZFS for GPL, um, but uh, but if but if if we can get more contributors, that's a that's a itself a copy lefted CC by SA project, and I'd I'd love for people to contribute to it and, and it improve it. References and it has a lot of references to, other, to various yeah. jurisdictions. And so the goal with there would be to have the the the, the handbook of G, of copy left around the world. So so it's nowhere near close to that yet, but I think that would be an end goal, and so that's a great way to to try and do that better. Um, and, 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 and so forth. We've so. invited lawyers from, um, from various jurisdictions to contribute to the guide, mm -hmm. um, and some are reviewing it. And then um, we also really welcome translations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's not that I wanted to censor you, but uh, we are already <laughs> at the limit of this talk. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. And I'll step out into the hallway, and Karen and I will be out there if you want to ask more questions uh, as the next speaker starts. And I've got stickers, your last chance to get them. Mm -hmm. <laughs>